We're a few minutes behind, but that's fine. I'll be quick and hopefully give you some time for questions at the end and being able to have a little time to chase rabbit trails is fun too because I'm an easily distracted guy. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself. My name's Chris Moore. I'm the uh, founder and lead developer of the PCBSD uh, desktop operating system. For those who don't know what that is, it's FreeBSD with fun utilities and graphical bits and this and that, which makes it very usable on a laptop, which is what I'm presenting on today, or a uh, you know, workstation and whatnot. But we've developed a lot of tools and utilities which are useful for sysadmins as well, and that's gonna be the focus of today's talk. So the problem we're gonna be addressing today you're a sysadmin or somebody who just needs to deploy FreeBSD or maybe a PCBSD system. Maybe you got you know, 30 workstations you need to deploy, a you know, bunch of servers in data center, et cetera. Maybe you like what you hear about this whole ZFS thing. You know, I, I give this talk at a lot of Linux conferences and that's the big one right there. Oh, ZFS, we hear so much magic about that. You know, our ButterFS doesn't do that yet. You know, how can we get on this ZFS thing? Now, uh, just right up front, I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm. I'm one of the, the kind of speakers where I don't mind if you interrupt me. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we can you know, chase a rabbit trail or whatever if you want to go into a little more depth on something you see on the slides. If it's something I'm going to cover later, I'll tell you and we'll, we'll get on to that a little later. But uh, the slides are usually pretty simplistic, so if you want to go into detail, just let me know. But uh, right now there's currently two ways to do this if you're going to deploy a bunch of systems. Solution number one is write your own installation scripts, configure all the network booting by hand, and then you can maintain it forever. A lot of fun. You know, when you want to consider this, maybe you have a very unique installation. Maybe you have some off-the-wall file system layout you just have to do in a very particular way, or you're just a free BSD god, and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna go edit Gpart, and do this and that, and set up my partitions the way I want. Well, in which case, congratulations, but this talk may be for the rest of the people. You know, when not to consider that, if manual disk partitioning just isn't your thing, or you work for a living and have other things you want to get done during your day. So solution number two we're going to be looking at today is using our, our newly developed utility, the PC Thin Client, which is included with PCBSD and uh, TrueOS. For those who don't know, TrueOS is just the PCBSD server edition. It's free BSD with extra utilities like this in it. So if you grab TrueOS 9.1, it's free BSD 9.1 release with just some extra commands available for jail management and, uh, and utilities like this. You know, when you want to consider this is you really don't enjoy disk partitioning as I don't, and you want to have a weekend because, you know, maintaining your own scripts and finding out they don't work Friday right before you gotta leave really sucks. So what you're gonna need to get started with this, a system with a network interface. In some cases you may want two, and I'll explain that here in a minute why that may be advantageous. Um, you'll want to be running PCBSD 9.1 or TrueOS 9.1 or later when 9.2 hits. And you'll want a few gigabytes of disk space for you to play around with. So getting started is actually pretty easy. Once you've installed TrueOS, and I've given other talks on this, it's really simple, it's all graphical, click, click, next, done. You can have a VM set up in a few minutes. Pretty basic. We're just going to go ahead and grab the ports tree. So on, uh, from the console, you're going to run port snap, fetch extract update, or pick your preferred method of getting ports. Doesn't really matter as long as they get there. If you're on the desktop, we have GUIs for everything, so you can just go to control panel, system managers, tasks, and then fetch ports, and it'll do it all graphically for you. Hey Chris, is that fetch ports into base? Yeah, yeah, so that'll fetch ports into user ports, which is where we're going to be expecting it for this utility. And then to get us started, I don't know if you can see it very well back there. Maybe I can control lights here. Or maybe not. I'm not going to mess with buttons that I can't understand. But anyway, we're just going to run the PC Thin Client utility. Just one command. The first thing it's going to pop up and, and ask you is, hey, we're going to now convert this system into a Thin Client server. Who doesn't know what a Thin Client is, by the way, and why we use that term? Everyone knows? Okay. Well, thin client, you know, for those who maybe are curious why we refer to it as that, it may be a diskless client, some client which has no hard drive and maybe just is gonna boot up off the network interface. That's what I mean by thin client when I refer to that. So we're gonna say yes, we'd like to continue. Now the next question it's gonna ask you, and this is an important one, do you wanna make this a remote X desktop server or an install server? Now for today's talk, we're talking about an install server, but this is where we're going to make our first little detour to explain what the other option is and why you may want to use that. So a remote desktop in PCBSD, this is the true thin client of the thin client part. 
This is where you'll set up a system. Maybe you have a beefy server, which will operate as a, um, a pixie booting, diskless client uh, master server. So good example, we have, say, maybe a bunch of old P3s or P4s. We don't want to maintain them, but we just yank the disks out and give it to people as a workstation. Well, this is going to walk you through setting that up. So you can just plug those in, boot up off the server, and then all their data is stored on the server. It just brings you to a nice graphical login when it's all said and done. So why you'd want to run this? Again, maybe you have a bunch of low-end clients sitting around, old hardware that's just sitting there collecting dust, and you get some new workers at your office place who just need to be able to get on the internet, check email, do some basic web functionality. And you can do that over your network really easily without maintaining all these new installations. So this would be the way to do it. It really simplifies, of course, your backup, security, and management, because you're only taking care of one box, essentially. You know, the clients are replaceable. You know, why you shouldn't run that right now with our utilities, maybe you don't have a server of enough horsepower. I mean, obviously, everybody's running on one box. So if you have people running a lot of heavy-duty programs on there, you know, it's going to get busy pretty quick. The other thing is we don't do sound support on the clients right now. So no YouTube streaming. I'm sorry, your clients aren't going to get Pandora. Maybe we'll add that down the road, but at the moment, it's not included. OK, so now we're going to get back to what we're actually here to talk about, which is installations. So the first thing it's going to ask you is, we're going to need to run DHCPD on, this, uh, on some network interface so that we can uh, connect to clients and get them to boot up here. So we're going to go ahead and pick our interface. Of course, be careful which cable this is plugged into, because you're starting a, a daemon here, which is going to try and hand out IPs. Don't run that on your existing network. Once you give it the network interface, it's going to go ahead and set it all up for you. Again, I'm a desktop guy. I like GUIs. I like simplicity. I don't like having to do a lot of manual config, so I've tried to take all the config out of it for you. It's going to go ahead and, and install some stuff from ports. It's going to start the daemons, and it's going to just give you some basic information on where things are located. I'm going to go back into those in a, little bit, in a few minutes here so we can talk about what those different directories do. But at this point, you're done. I mean, this was maybe three to four minutes not counting the installation time, maybe another 10 minutes. But at this point, you now have an install server ready to deploy FreeBSD or PCBSD images. It was that quick. I mean, I did, when I set up my VirtualBox demo here, it was like 10 minutes. Very quick. All right, so now getting started, now that we're ready to roll, we just need a client system to connect. So you're going to need some client which supports Pixie booting. Not all NICs are equal. Some support it, some don't. You may need to go into the BIOS first and enable Pixie booting on that client. So. First thing to check if it's not working the way you expect. And then now I'm actually going to show you how this works, because you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I've already got my uh, client booted up here, or my host, excuse me. Let me start the client. 12, I'm going to boot from the end. Let me move that over. OK. Oh. You know what? Helps if you kill your presentation first. Yeah. There we go. Oh. oh, it's so faded out. Uh, is one of the techs here knows how to control the lights? Are they back there? Somebody want to try them? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. There we go. Now we're talking. Okay. So what we have here is I'm just running, uh, this is on my PCBSD desktop. Of course, it's VirtualBox. What I've done is I have two VMs running here. I have my host. Yay. That's not really the interesting part. This is the client we're looking at here. I've just booted it up. We'll assume for the purposes of this demonstration, it's just got a brand new disk we're ready to go ahead and do an installation on. Now, we've written some little dialogue-based menus. Not really fancy. You know, We're just here to do a quick install and be done with it. But the other option. Uh, in addition to installation is we also provide you an emergency shell. So this can be a useful way if you have a system something goes wrong on, you just need to really quickly boot up and don't want to go hunt down some media or whatever. You can plop it in here, drop to the shell, and do what you need to do. Yes? Yeah, this booted up off Pixie. Okay. There was no disk or media inserted into the drives. So that all came up off the land. And it was all pre-configured for you. You didn't see me talking about setting up IP addresses and configuring DHCPD or anything like that. I mean, unless I mentioned it earlier, right? That was all hidden. Well, the, the utility took care of all that for you. I mean, all you care about is getting systems installed, not the nitty gritty of figuring out what IP range to use, blah, blah. But anyway, here we are. I mean, again, 10 minutes into it, we're now ready to do an installation. 
So what's going to happen is you choose to install, and it's going to provide a couple example scripts for doing an installation on the system. This is where we're going to go after I do the demonstration, showing you how we build these scripts, what they can do, some of the features and power of, of using them. This is using the uh, PC sysinstall backend. Is anyone familiar or not familiar with that? I know I've given talks on it over years, but basically, you know, what it is is it's in FreeBSD uh, current. It's in 9.1, 9 stable. It's an alternate backend for installing FreeBSD or PCBSD. It supports things like ZFS out of box. It supports data set options, you know, jelly encryption, geom mirroring. I mean, it's got a lot of neat features. But the cool thing is, every single install you do is a scripted install, 100% scripted. So they're easy to repeat and reproduce. It's easy to prototype with it, make adjustments, et cetera. But uh, in this case, uh, on the PC uh, Thin Client utility, it's just going to provide an example. I've created another ZFS install here, which I can show you in a minute what that script does. But the example is fully functional. I can just go ahead and say, yes, I want to install that. And it's now going to go ahead and start doing the installation on my client system. I think the example uses a UFS, so it's doing some of the GPART set up here, <laughs> stamping bootloaders, and then it's going to go ahead and create the UFS file systems. And as you can see, it's pulling this all from the, the host system at the moment. Is multicast? Multicast? No. Not, um, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't messed with it. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, you can kind of see there, that's what it's doing. It's setting up UFS with soft updates journaling. So um, while that's running, it'll take about two, three minutes. Any other questions really quick before we go into how to customize your installation? Again, the setup was pretty simple. I'm trying to keep this very easy for non-technical, non-even FreeBSD folks. Yes? Um, is the server component, uh, I'm assuming it's just the first one to the data, uh, the commit, or? Yeah, it's just, it's uh, honestly the server component. The PC Thin Client doesn't actually install any daemons of its own. All it does is it facilitates the setup of the DHCP daemon, and then it enables it in rc.conf. It does some magic to turn on NFS. Um, you know, it just turns on the hooks in etsyrc.conf. Say you were following a wiki page, it would come out with something very similar to that. Well, well my question was, hmm? how easy is it to start and stop the server? Say, oh. I didn't want to leave this running all the time. Sure. It would just be as simple as running user local etsyrc.d isc dhcpd stop, okay, so you know, okay. or just, you know, removing the entry in rc.conf and reboot. But uh, here we go. So the installation is just about finished. I just did a FreeBSD 9.1 install to my client. And yes, I have all the debug symbols. Speaking of which, last week when I was building ISOs for this show, I'm like, why is my DVD too big to fit on a DVD? And I was like, oh, all the debugging's on. Oh, that sucks. Rebuild. All right, so there we go. That was it. Now it's checking for packages. I don't think I have any in this case. It's setting up users, passwords. And I am done. And that's it. So now I may close and reboot this VM. Again, this all came off the client, or off the host. And we just did a full installation. And we can do installations of any type of media you want. So if you roll your own custom images you want to distribute, it's really easy to do. And here we go. We're now booting FreeBSD 9.1. Yes? Are you able to host multiple app servers? Um, sure. I mean, I'll show you where we st where we store the. Uh, oh, you mean multiple servers? <sighs> Probably some trickery in the DHCPD. Actually, I'd ask like Josh Petzl. Is that possible to have it point to two like Pixie booting? Sure. You do. Probably have to hardwire the MAC address out. Okay. It doesn't set that up for you automatically, but I mean, again, it's there's no real magic to it, so you can go and edit the config by hand if you need to. But there we go. We've booted our client up. We're ready to roll. But that's not really the interesting part. The interesting part is seeing what kind of installations we can do with all this. Let me show you here. OK. So now that we've shown it's easy to really go ahead and install the system, of course you're going to want to customize that. You don't want my stock FreeBSD image. Maybe you have something on your own you want. So this is all just entirely on the server side. There's going to be a couple key directories you're going to want to take note of. So the first one is uh, the home thin client install scripts. That's where your PC sys install scripted installation config files are going to live. And then we have a directory we create automatically called install archives. That's where your TBZ files, maybe your dist files are live. You can organize these any way you want by hand. And I'll show you how we do that. 
When the client boots up, it just mounts them under slash install scripts and slash install archives. So that's where they are on the client end. So the examples provided, it does do a UFS install, but the first thing most people are gonna be doing is going, oh, I wanna switch to ZFS. How hard is that to do in a PC sys install config? It's actually not that hard at all. So this will be the example provided in our, our shipped script. So you wanna switch that to ZFS. It's as simple as changing it to this one line. All we're doing is saying, okay, my new partition is ZFS. I'm saying zero for the size, which use the whole size of the disk or partition, and then a bunch of data sets that I want to create. That can get pretty complex. You're able to put flags for those data sets on that line and everything, but for the purpose of the, the example I'm showing here, I kept it pretty, pretty straight up simple. But I didn't create a swap in this example, but if you wanted to, you'd just throw a swap line back in, allocate some space for swap. All right, but say you want to install from your own installation archive, say you've rolled your own custom FreeBSD with some additional patches. Again, in the PC sys install script, this is actually pretty easy to do. So in our example, we're just extracting a static tarball. That's all we're doing, just one big fat archive. Well, in your case, you can come in here and say, okay, it's still in the same directory and I've put my own FreeBSD release tarball in there. And the package type is set to tar. We support a number of different formats for that, and I'm gonna show you a couple of those here in a minute. But uh, user management, again, very simple. So say I need to set up users on my system. This looks very similar to sysinstall, if you've ever done sysinstall uh, scripted installations. I tried to keep it that way, so it was uh, not a huge learning curve. But we're gonna say, here's our root password. I wanna create a user. You can have as many blocks of these as you want, so if you need to put 30 users on a system, you can just, bam, just script them all in and the PC sys install wizard will add them for you. So advanced stuff would be, say we wanna run commands now. This is where it's kinda of cool. Say you need to customize your images that you're uh, shipping. So PC sys install supports a couple different methods for running commands. The first one will be running something with the run command directive. This is actually executed inside the shrouded environment of the installed system. So say your image has some initialization script that you're shipping and you need to run that one time before you boot the system. You can easily throw that in a PC sys install and say run that in the Sharoot, and it'll remember where it needs to go to do that. But say you need to run something outside the Sharoot, we can also run external commands. So when we do PC uh, BSD installs, sometimes we have to mount devfs to do things inside the, the installed system. And we expose some variables like fsmnt, which tells us where it's currently mounted. Any questions on that so far? Okay. So packages, this gets really fun because now we have two package systems, right? We made it really simple to use. So in PC, in your config file, you're just gonna say, I want to install packages and you can just give the short names if you'd like. It'll go ahead and find those, pull them from your package repository and install them. Um, the only thing with doing the short names is sometimes they're not what you expect. So a little trial and error may be necessary in that case or check fresh ports, which is a great website. Package NG support just got added recently though. This is what we're doing with all our rolling release stuff. So what it'll do is this is automatically detected. You don't have to go and specify package NG or old packages. When you tell it to install packages, the first one it, it starts to install, it's actually gonna check the format of it for you and go, oh, this is an old style package. Oh, this is package NG. If it's package NG, it's automatically gonna bootstrap it for you into the client system because you have to install the package command set up a few things beforehand, it'll handle all that for you, and then it just continues on the installation as normal. So FreeBSD disk file support was also added recently. So say you built your files a little differently. Instead of a big fat tarball, you have your FreeBSD disk files. Again, great. Changing the config is really simple to do that. We're still installing from a local medium because it's just mounted on the client. We can change the path here. So you remember how I showed you earlier we had slash install archive? You can make your own directories. Put it wherever you want, just point it to wherever, wherever it's at, and then change the package type to dist, and then which bits of the dist do you want? Again, very, very easy to use. So now we want to put the automated into fully automated though. Say you want to do this completely unattended. You have a bunch of systems, you just want to plug them in, walk away, get a cup of coffee, come back and have it be done. That's really easy to do on this. What we can do is, uh, first of all, we have our default unattended.cfg script. If you create that, it's gonna go ahead and use it. When you boot that client, you're gonna get a 30 second warning, and then it's gonna do the installation. When it's done, it'll shut the system down. 
Of course, if you use this, don't plug this cable into the wrong system by mistake. You know, plug it into your boss's workstation and you get an early weekend. So, just saying. But anyway, uh, be very careful with that, but that will do a completely unattended installation. Uh, I don't think I put it on the slides, but another thing you can do is you can create MAC address files. So, you can say MAC address.cfg of the client and have a script ready to go for that particular system, and it'll use that as well. It'll check the client's MAC address and say, okay, we found a config. So this would be something, say you're uh, deploying a lot of systems, you could have somebody pre-generating configuration options, we want this, this layout, these users, and then you could even write a front end which says, okay, I'm gonna copy this to this Mac, we have the Mac of the system, and then all your, all your guy in the back room has to do is just plug it in, it installs, it shuts down when he's done, he's ready to roll. So I, I get asked a lot about scalability at Linux shows, like how many systems can I do th this on? Well, first of all, the CPU instructions are run on the client. This is not being run on the server. The server is just a big, large file server. So your, your real scalability issues are gonna come from disk IO and network speed. So a couple, couple tips um, regard to that. Oh, first of all, is how many clients. I have it pre-configured in the dhcp.conf to have 99 clients. Again, this is all stuff you can modify by hand. Our script's not gonna complain if you do it. We're just trying to get you set up real easy out of the box, but this is where you would go in and say, okay, I wanna add some other IP address ranges. So tips and tricks. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, every install with PC Sys install is a completely scripted install. This is where it gets really cool to do prototyping. Say you have a virtual box or VMware or something on your system. You can grab the PCBSD DVD, which has a wonderful GUI for setting up ZFS, file system layouts, users, et cetera, packages, the whole nine yards. You can go through and do an installation with that and it'll generate a config script for you. After the install's done on the installed system, it actually saves a copy of that for you. So you can prototype an installation for a customer all graphically some of you doesn't know anything about the, the you know, details, just says, oh, he needs Apache, he needs ZFS, and the GUI can handle it. Or if you want to get into nitty gritty, you can go and really set it up the way you want. And then you just grab that config script when you're done. And uh, it's ready to roll at that point. You throw it on your thin client server, boom, done. I've just prototyped an entire class of servers or workstations or something. Um, very simple to use. So again, that's, I can't stress this enough, especially when I go to Linux shows and these guys are like, well, I know kind of how ZFS works, and I'm like, well, just let the GUI handle it for you, give it the basics of what you want, it'll take care of the nitty gritty, and then now you're ready to deploy, and that, that's really handy. So speeding up the installation, you know, we've had people who give us a bunch of different suggestions. I mean, you can use ZFS mirror drives, SSD. If you want to get crazy, you could even use tempfs on the system, copy all your disk files in it, boot up, and just serve it right out of memory. Pretty stinking quick. So what's coming up in the future? Well, first of all, we do have some more improvements to PC Sys install we're looking at. Um, there's a few extra things with Geom mirroring I'm looking at fixing here in the near future. Uh, some additional stuff with Jelly, you know, just little ZFS things. And if you have some feature that you find is not working or doesn't work the way you expect or you not want more support for, you can usually email me and I'll put it on the list and uh, get to it hopefully soon. Um, another thing I'm looking at doing is changing a little bit how the thin client utility works in 9.2 so it's just a little faster. You won't need the ports tree. Since we now uh, ship our own package in G repo, it'll just pull the packages down and install it for you. You won't have to run anything on the system. You just run the one command, okay, you're done in two minutes, ready to roll. So that's, that's what I'll be hitting probably for 9.2. So um, questions and comments now, but this is some great places. First of all, the wiki. If you go to wiki.pcbsd.org, we have a great article with all the nitty gritty details on PC Sys install, the available flags, how they can be used, a lot of examples, and of course our mailing lists and forums are a great place to ask questions too. But now I want to go ahead and ask you guys, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at this time. Yeah, yes? Oh, go ahead. Not NTFS, yeah. Um, you could, yeah. Which works. It could do DD. Yeah. So there is an option in PC Sys install just to give it an image and say splat that on a disk with DD. So as long as you have the right image ready to roll, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, Matt. Um, so, so if I have several CP system calls in space, you know, for different options, yeah. um, do they show up in that lib dialog and when they get it, do you just scan the directory? For we scan the directory for them, yeah. So you'll just name them something like this is Brett's workstation or whatever, and, and it goes. So yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is there anything checking like the, the integrity of your uh, like it goes through and it runs a basic check of the config file for sanity first to make sure that it looks good yeah. before it proceeds. And then hopefully we catch the major problems well, before we start. Like, like for, for instance, um, we've got a bunch of key logs running here mm -hmm. over satellite connections. Uh, okay. And can be sketchy. Yeah. Sure, sure. So like, is there anything checking to make sure that we actually have a real image before? Um, well, it's going to go ahead and see if it, can, if it can find the file. As long as the file's there, it won't know until it starts using tar to read from it, I suppose. But yeah, that may be the only hiccup. No, we're just checking to see it exists. As long as it exists, then we'll assume it's still there when it goes to do the install a minute or two later and read from it. Yeah, well. Oh, on the server, you mean, right? Sure. Oh, well, you would do the remote desktop option then. Because, yeah, if you use the remote desktop option, they will just boot up via Pixie, get an NFS mounts and all that from the server, never touches their disk. And then they get a nice uh, GDM login prompt, and then they log into KDE or GNOME or whatever from right there. I mean, the disk is never touched. Everything is on server side, which is a pretty cool utility. We've had a number of people use it. Oh, this works, except for sound. So when they whine about YouTube, yeah. Oh well. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Yeah. Oh yes, yes. Um, so the PC sys install can fetch it from FTP, HTTP, pretty much anything fetch supports. You can give it uh, you know, pretty much anything that uh, again fetch does. Local URL. It can even mount a CD if you have a CD in the drive. It'll do that for you. It's just a flag to say here's my media location. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I should put that in the slides actually for next for next time I give this talk. But yeah, that's something you could do. You could have a web URL somewhere that's on your local internet or out on the net and just say here it is. That's actually how we do some FreeBSD installs. We can go pull something off of FTP archive and say, okay, grab that image and install it. And as long as your net connection stays up, it'll it'll go through and do it. Yeah, Alfred. Uh-huh. Is a plugin like do this portion? Sure, why not? Is we can run we run PC sys install I think on FreeNAS already or we have it there. Yeah, yeah. So all we do is copy the script over, do a little magic and it works. Yeah, that would actually be really cool. It's making FreeNAS a deployment server. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, that would actually be really cool. Talk to me about that afterwards. It'd be awesome. Any other questions, guys? Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.